Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Max Fields. I'm the Associate Curator and Director of Publishing at PhotoFest, and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's Creative Conversations digital program featuring Rodrigo Valenzuela in conversation with Macarena gomez Barris. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge those supporters who make PhotoFest programs such as this one possible, including the National Endowment for the Arts, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation, the Powell Foundation, the Wortham Foundation, David and Martha Moore, the WWW Foundation, the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, Nina and Michael Zilka, the PhotoFest Board of Directors, and the generous donors to the PhotoFest Annual Fund. Thank you for your support. I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers for tonight's program. They are two incredibly accomplished creatives whose work in art and academia is advancing the discourse surrounding the intersection of art, aesthetics, social justice, politics, and cultural production, among many other complex subjects. Artist Rodrigo Valenzuela was born in 1982 in Santiago, Chile. His work has been presented in several solo and group exhibitions around the globe, including at PhotoFest in 2015. His recent shows include exhibitions at the New Museum and the Kitchen in New York, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, the Fry Museum, Fry Art Museum, the Portland Art Museum, the Ulrich Art Museum, Claude Man, and most recently at Kandelhofer Gallery in Vienna, which saw the opening of his exhibition, Stature, just this last Saturday. Rodrigo has been a resident artist at renowned residencies all over the world, but our audience might remember him from his time in Houston between 2014 and 2016 at the core residency at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. For those who are not familiar with Rodrigo's work, a monograph surveying his work titled Journeyman was published just last month and is available for purchase through Moose Publishing. Valenzuela currently lives and works in Los Angeles where he's an assistant professor in the Department of Art at UCLA's School of the Arts and Architecture. And we're so pleased to have him with us tonight. Tonight also features the renowned author, critic and scholar Macarena gomez Barris. Her work focuses on cultural memory, author authoritarian, oh no, author I'm gonna skip this uh, word, unfortunately. Author, ter I, I'm not gonna do it tonight, stumbling over. Queer decolonial femme epistemes and political violence. She is the author of many excellent books, including The Extractive Zone, Social Ecologies and Decolonial Perspectives, which theorizes social life through five extract extractive scenes of ruinous capitalism upon indigenous territories, published by Duke University Press in 2017. She is also the author of Beyond the Pink Tide, Art and the Political Undercurrents in the Americas, published by the University of California Press. And she's also the author of Where Memory Dwells, Culture and, the St and State Violence in Chile. She's currently working on three new book projects, Latchkey, a work of fiction, and At the Sea's Edge, a scholarly book, and Decolonial Ecologies that rewrites environmental history from the perspective of decolonial mo mo movements. Macarena is the director of the Global South Center and chairperson of the Social Science and Cultural Studies at Pratt Institute. I want to thank Veronica Teo for putting me in contact with Macarena. We're so lucky to have her with us tonight. Tonight's program will begin with a brief presentation by each of the guests and then shift to a conversation. Following their conversation, we'll open up the room to a Q&A for a Q&A with the audience. And for those watching on Zoom, you can submit your questions in the chat. Those who are streaming the program on YouTube Live can simply submit a comment. Again, I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. And now I'd like to ask uh, Rodrigo to uh, join us now. Hello. Hi, Max, thank you very much for having me. Not a problem. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up your slideshow. Cool, thank you very much. I mean, I thought um, it could be a good way to start here since uh, I will be in conversation with Macarena um, and she um, and her research in Chile and the political movements and the history of violence that happened in my country and in her country. So, uh, and this project that uh, actually in Chile right now in Vienna, uh, has a lot to do with the history of Latin America. Uh, I started working on this uh, project called General Song, which is the whole exhibition, uh, thinking about uh, Pablo Neruda's book of poem, uh, Canto General, that addresses, um, or is trying to retell the story of Latin America from Latin American perspective. 
uh, beautiful poems, very powerful um, prose, uh, but I also was, uh, was troubled by the idea of uh, uh, writing an um, anti-colonialist language, uh, a, a poem or book in the colonizer's language. So that led me to think a lot about what other kind of flaws in the language that we have. Um, right after Trump's election, I was I started thinking about what are the materials that, uh, you know, maybe this protest or the lack of protest during Trump um, uh, was about of lack of language of civil disobedience. So civil disobedience. So I, if you can move uh, the slices slowly, please, um, you know, I start thinking about institutions that I was familiar, the way that, uh, you know, went to, ch to a school in Chile, uh, it's kind of block into the schedule of school. Like, well, we have a month of protests around September. So you never know how that, uh, how, how how long that's gonna last. So it, it's kind of, it's so part of our environment that I was considering this kind of like uh, marches and the, the, the Pacific style of um, um, after Trump's election that it, it didn't lead to a lot of radical changes. And I thought like, um, in re the, the re I saw it as a lack of language, not necessarily as a lack of passion, right? So I was considering the, the aesthetic of the, the barricade as a departure point and thinking about um, taking elements from the poems, from the book of poems, I start thinking from there, from the clay, from the, um, as Neruda put it, Latin America being this giant coming from clay and to re re recall this plant. Uh, I was uh, starting assembling this series. In the same way, I start making after this, the mask, uh, the, um, they were usually used uh, in type in type of oppression. Um, I don't know if you can move a little faster to get to the mask. I will. That uh, these are very popular in Latin America making homemade masks, and I was thinking um, that that was like again another symbol of like using kind of um, component of capitalism and component uh, of uh, globalization um, in your benefit this time collecting them and like transforming them into something that can help you to protest that capitalism or those imperialist forces. So what I did is just basically start doing the same, like collaging some masks and taking um, self portraits of myself with like this mask. Um, they were kind of precariously put together with a bicycle tape and you know, and my, my skin was covered with clay. Uh, so the whole, bar, the whole show embodied this, uh, idea of fragility that the clay have, but also the authenticity and the like coming from the grounds up to like uh, rebel against something. Um, so, and that has been kind of the departure for a very different work that I've been doing and, and the way that I've been thinking about shows as a, or making art as a show, so as a kind of like, in, as a full concept that they are chapters in a, pro, in a practice. And uh, hopefully I get to uh, talk about the next Paris Award where I've been talking in the last three, two shows consecutively about um, modernism as a way of, a, uh, as a way to like have a some sort of imperialist aesthetic and a way to like, um, and how much it uh, took cover in Latin America. So I think those are my five minutes. Max. Um, thank you. And um, Macarena, I'm going to go ahead and pull up your slide. And if you'd like to join us for your presentation. There we wonderful. go. All right. And... Thank you, Rodrigo. That was wonderful. And I think um, I just really want to thank Rodrigo and Max and Veronica for having me here and for the lovely invitation to be with you tonight. And um, I'm really thrilled to think about these intersections that Max just talked about and Rodrigo's work really elucidated, uh, the intersections of the role of art in my own work writing and towards imagining a kind of politics that is really um, beyond the nation state. And I think in the work that Rodrigo just showed us, the masking, the reworking, the aesthetics of the street um, really shows us a creative practice now of what kind of art production can look like that's socially and politically engaged and relevant. So thank you for showing that. 
So um, reflecting on the arc of my own writing and practice, I think my objective has been to find ways in what we in Spanish call el duelo or what in English we might refer to as the wound of the colonial or colonialism and modernity. And I've really worked a lot in situated research and interviews, um, next slide. Uh, with survivors of torture, disappearance, and dictatorship. And this was the, my early work was my first book, Where Memory Dwells. And it told the story of the aftermath of the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile and how liberal democracy often wants to smooth over these very buried histories. Uh, in many ways, the US racial state has buried the ghosts of its own foundational violence by writing out um, settler colonialism and transatlantic slavery. And this is a story that really tries to unearth these ghosts. Um, but from a modern perspective, next slide. So, um, in work that took me to the former concentration camps and memorial parks and torture camps and artists' houses and human rights archives and sites of community struggle, I tracked the new phase of capitalism during the kind of 1970s moment that rose up and was created by the Chicago Boys and Milton Friedman and Hayek and the so-called neoliberalism. And I talked about how this was actually made through the ruins of socialist bodies. And I think here there's some convergence with Rodrigo's work on the ruins. In particular, in this authoritarian regime that was cruel and had a cruel impact, especially on female and gendered bodies. Next slide. So during the time I was researching violence and its afterlives in relationship to the Pinochet era and that dictatorship, I came across this slide. Yet because my, race, my research was framed within the nation state, I could not yet approximate or theorize or track the longer arc of genocide in the Southern hemisphere that this slide represents the military campaigns in the Southern uh, Biobio region the indigenous women and children that had long been criminalized by the state for refusing to assimilate or to abandon their ancestral modes of organizing social life. So as we do when we're making work or thinking about things and theorizing, um, I set the image aside, but it continued to haunt me. Next slide. That archival trace, what I found in the archive actually prompted a longer research that lasted 10 years for me on the overlap between genocide, feminicide, and ecocide, the killing of you know, um, an indigenous population, the killing of uh, female populations, and the killing of the, uh, the natural world. And I focused on the Medicas, and this resulted in the book, The Extractive Zone. And what it does is really consider what the great writer, uh, Eduardo Galeano, if you name Pablo Nerudo, I bring in Eduardo Galeano, what he first called the open veins of Latin America and what we might refer to as the new extractivisms and the mega extractivisms that are taking place within South America. Next slide. And I did that by looking at Latin America and South America, next slide, through a number of uh, sub-national places. So what, it, what does it mean to actually think about region and the regional? I looked at petroleum industry and what I called spiritual tourism and hydroelectricity and pine plantations in this very um, monocultural regions. Next slide. And it was important to do grounded work and study these spaces. And one place was Southwestern Cauca Valley in Colombia. And following the track of the river here, the Magdalena, rather than looking at the nation state of Colombia actually allowed me to think outside of the frame of the nation. Currently, next slide, there are 22 dams uh, across the southern part of Colombia and with, um, next slide, the great, uh, wonderful artist Carli Carolina Caicedo, Mestiza from these communities, I tracked how she tried to track in and the, the disappearing river, this is a satellite image that shows the disappearance and extinction of the river Magdalena because of these mega extractive and medium um, hydroelectric dams. And so what it means to actually write the river back in with her hand in embodied ways, next slide. So that led me to think about uh, a number of different issues in artistic and political works in the, what I'm calling the undercurrents or the places that are undetectable by the state, um, these art and political nexuses. Next slide. 
And some of that work is really thinking with artists alongside the great Cecilia Vicuña, next slide, who has been working with fragile and embodied practices for over 50 years and just recently recognized uh, globally for this incredible environmental eco work. Here you see her hands is representing the red ties or these algae blooms in um, oceans. And so what it means to blur the relationship between human and the non-human, next slide. And I'm also interested, next slide, in what it means to actually go, uh, play along the sea's edge and think about the Pacific and play with the Pacific as if it were a living being rather than something to be extracted, next slide. So my work is really thinking also about, like uh, Vicuña, what it means to do this work in toxic polluted spaces. And she points out that the name Aconcagua is actually an indigenous group that also was renamed by the oil refinery. Next slide. I'm also interested in work uh, in the borderlands and because you know you all are located in Houston in Texas what it means to bring forward the work of a Chicana brown queer artist like Laura Aguilar and her idea of Sandy's room you know this is not um, uh, Virginia's Wolf's a room of one's own but this is Sandy's room it could be a lover's room or a friend's room and she's there kind of in the heat of East LA in the middle of the summer next slide so what it means to rewrite self-portraiture work uh, in this case, you know, not the narcissist of the Greek myth, but of the Chicana, as uh, Laura uh, Aguilar put it, her own fat, queer, brown body in front of, um, you know, something like a, a lake or a pond or a mirror that's reflecting back a very different image, a counter hegemonic or non dominant image of this different kind of body. Next slide. And so I just wanted to end by suggesting that part of my work, and I think this is also true with Rodrigo's work, and maybe one reason we'll be in conversation tonight, and what it means to actually access the space of the gallery in this moment, to think of non-extractive relations, to imagine and put the laboring body back into um, how we think and how we think about um, a mode of politics beyond the nation state. This seems to me very central in the moment in our current political situation in our world, if we're to imagine a future today. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much for that, Macarena. Uh, Rodrigo, do you want to go ahead and join us on video? Um, and there we go. Um, well, thank you both again for being here. I'm really excited to have this opportunity um, to speak with you and um, I thought an interesting way to start this conversation uh, tonight was to talk about the relationship between aesthetics, art, and activism um, as it relates to social movements and history. Um, both of your work, in both of your work, you talk about um, potentiality and um, the sites at which you're, you know, uh, locating potentials um, are, you know, as you were talking about, both of you were talking about, like, often ruins or spaces of um, um, precarity. So I'm just curious to hear about, um, and maybe we can do this by talking through the work, um, and I, I, can, I can queue up those images, but I'm just cur curious to hear your initial thoughts on um, how art and aesthetic, how aesthetics and activism, social movements, cultural critique, how that sort of comes together um, to really inform, you know, what you've called Macarena, like world making. You know, uh, I mean, it's, um, I, I wanted to, because I I thought something that Macarena said by the end of her presentation is very important that it's very hard sometimes to start speaking about an issue when we don't have a, when we start basically subjugated by the power of the, the hegemonic powers that we have to deal in order to talk about issues, right? We like have to talk about issues in terms of like how far they go towards or against certain symbols right and I, and I wanted to like see if you could possibly show uh, the project that come um, immediately after um, general song is uh, the, the show I did by Jordan Schnitzer because I, I thought that um, it was very interesting to like to, it's something that before even we have to uh, develop a language to protest or like, to come to like uh, reframe our history we have to like like first kind of reframe in which kind of places they're taught, right? Or like uh, that, like we just have to like small rooms of uh, Chicano studies or like very small rooms in big universities where they have like this. Uh, can you go next one, please? Or next, uh, immediately after this, I made that show 
that uh, was uh, kind of co this considering the history of um you know that i get invited to shows a lot and i get to show in a lot of museums but a lot of the time i go on the previous show or my work of the previous show or the show when i go to do business this is like kind of mediocre art and that is not really interesting or to me or like and, and then i go to the permanent collection and they have like they have to really fundraise to get some young latino artists or some black artists and then but then you see the the, the collection is full of mediocre american art right and it's this is not like and then you read about american art that and it's all about sublime and issues that like you know a landscaping painting that some old dude did uh, like um in the 1800s and slowly get to all this get to climb the philosophical ideas of uh being you know this epic tale sublime mostly uh, so if you can for, move forward, so when I when I go to see these shows, uh, I decide to uh, position my work in the in, in in the place where they could be uh, have priority, right? My discord could be fierce, not necessarily. So, uh, and I did this in a way of like concealing the permanent exhibition of the of the museum in this box. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that like there is a all the all the paint all the landscape paintings that have to do with sublime on the land and the on the on manifest destiny they were inside the box so you cannot get in you the, you can only see the permanent collection through the cracks of my work so in that case i wanted to make the discord that was in, that was about landscape painting and about something as simple as like portraying the land that where you live um, and give priority to my to my discord and then and leave the this like hegemonic um, kind of hiding behind history or like kind of like have to see it through um, my lens or like through my work right so it was something uh, it does remind me the the converse the, the, the uh, by then of my conversation was uh, uh, was very interesting the idea of like kind of how to combat how to convey the first the hegemonic language or the the knowledge that we are imposed before we start kind of like addressing the real issues because it, it, it is we have less resources in academia to talk about the issues that we care you know so i don't know they wanted to like um can i put that in you know just the, the ruins or the issues of um uh, how to address the the problems that to me are important it's like you know it's how to how to make about part of the contemporary language and not part of the um you know uh, some sort of Latin American uh, problem, right? Because there are issues that like have happened to most of the world, <laughs> like the, the problem of colonialism. It's not like a, it's not a problem, but it's bad. So I was, I was very interested in considering the language of it, like which kind of language I'm using for it and like what kind of like what I have to fight against it first. I mean, I think these are very interesting and pertinent comments that you're making, Rodrigo, and also how to, use the various languages, grammars, idioms, you know, of a kind of modernist and colonial inheritance in order to be able to produce an institutional critique, which I think is part of <coughs> what you're doing there, right, is really um, getting inside the institution and then showing it scaffolding, even the way in which you hang the paintings, there's a kind of scaffolding and a visibility and a um, a, a richness about what it means to see the innards of the workings of power. And, you know, the, the last slide that I showed of Aguilar's work, the kind of artist, uh, you know, uh, will work for access, that kind of idea of who gets to access, the, the kind of mediocrity, the, the new naming and tokenism of, of certain kinds of BIPOC or Black Indigenous people of color artists in relationship to the institution. So it's definitely the case. And I recently made the argument and I would stand by it that, you know, I think this kind of critique is really important, but there's a way in which in a moment, right, of authoritarian gestures, of massive accumulation of capitalism, of a shifting and transitional economy, of new forms, of, even beyond neoliberalism, new forms of capitalism that we're seeing in kind of the pandemic and disaster capitalism, as Naomi Klein would say, I think one thing we might want to think about too is to kind of what is the role, our role as artists, as critics, as curators, as thinkers, makers, doers, uh, beers, participants, um, precisely in these institutions. And do we want to 
of course, decolonize these institutions, but at the same time, what it means to actually hold on to them in public spaces. You know, I live in New York and Brooklyn, and I'm not far from the Brooklyn Museum, and I'm not far from a whole host of independent museums around this network that are closing in this time, not Brooklyn Museum, of course, but are really struggling. And we're, um, what it means to kind of hold on to these third spaces or these public institutions in this moment and these kinds of programming efforts, you know, um, post the pandemic, right? So I, I really love the kind of questions you're bearing down and the idioms and languages and how to think about that. And I think there's a there's a role here uh, for us to, to really salvage the ruins um, and, and in the in the efforts to both decolonize them, but then also to imagine the important role in, in what we might do um, with these with these spaces. So this is part, of, I think, of the kind of politics of aesthetics now that we have to really consider. Yeah, you know? yeah I think there is. Um, I mean, when when you go, you know, when I'm new at the school, but also I feel as a, I'm a relatively new immigrant, right? So. Uh, every new place I go from living in Boston to living in Seattle to living in Houston to living in LA, there is, uh, I always encounter this kind of like, uh, kind of like new old nostalgia for the place that is not longer there, right? And as a new person, as a new person, you are always kind of fascinated by it because it's like, it is like, it's kind of feels constantly evolving at the same time, kind of attached to this idea that like it's going before them. Like, so it's like, it's not what it used to be, but I don't have memories of what it used to be, right? So it's like, there is like, um, it's kind of like a phantom thread of like missing something that you, the thing's supposed to be. And that is kind of the psychological trauma that like education have done that you, you're done missing things that they were never there in the beginning. And then like you, you keep attaching to this idea of like, kind of, um, you know, the ruins, for example, right? Like I moved to a place like Seattle that is very kind of new economy and like, um, and it's constantly changing. And I made that project about the, the about in the Friar Museum, the, of the future ruins, because I, I, I was feeling that there would not be like, um, there's always gonna be the future ruins that you wanna miss and of a past. And like, it's almost a city never have come to maturity and they're already missing something. And I think that that happened a lot when um, uh, when they took it for they, when a lot of society have taken for granted some change because it's like and I was part of like um, the promise of education and I think uh, they wouldn't consider what is the new person will offer right it's, it's like the new uh, and in this case the immigrant the diversity or the openness that uh, that would happen when you actually. Uh, get shaken up of like that kind of kind of Western uh, notion of uh, knowledge, and I and I think that like institutions. Uh, and, I mean, the next project also is about like institutions, about the monolithic quality of institutions and how much people attach themselves to these uh, monolithic ideas, and um, and yeah, it's it's, it's kind of hard to resolve because um, in some way, and again, it's like it becomes a like a center, like even if you want to fight with them, you always had like, you know, to me, the idea of a co -op or, I mean, in, in LA, we have a really good system, um, museum, the underground museum, that is very wonderful project by an artist, uh, by Noah David, that like, it's very interesting because it's like, um, you don't need to, like the biggest institutional critique is just a start your own museum, <laughs> you know, like it's a, like, just, just make it, make, make it on. So, and, and, I'm, and I'm really interested in that kind of system as the Caja Negra in Chile, in Santiago, I don't know if you ever research about it, like co-ops of artists, I think are much more productive in some way to disrupt those like, um, uh, that kind of institutionalization in our minds. And I think the only way, and, and right now I'm working a lot with the idea of labor unions, because I think that is a, you know, after COVID we're gonna see, it's gonna be a huge crisis on labor. And the only way that we can fix it is like losing respect for institutions and start associating our, each other and start building more of those like uh, kind of institutions made by people in some way. Yeah, and I know um, Max, you have other questions for us to consider, but you know, this is such a productive line of thinking. So I just want to respond briefly to something that Rodrigo is saying. I think, you know, your own work really um, you know, it's not a coincidence that the laboring body is there and present within the fragments, you know, it's kind of that 
that thing I mentioned about the kind of hopeless <coughs> bodies or the bodies in ruin of economic systems that that kind of extract from flesh, right? Um, and the kind of blood and sinews and flesh that are embedded in in even our computers. Um, John Beller has fascinating work on that. Um, so I, I think there's a way in which you're making that very visible and I hear you. And, you know, I also think it's not a coincidence. I mean, I was born much earlier than you in 1970 in the moment of a kind of euphoric project that was just underway in Chile, the possibility of a different kind of future for not only Latin America, but internationally. So many people were there during the Allende's, you know, very short lived but important uh, socialist experiment. And then, you know, you were born in a very different moment in the middle of dictatorship, right? And what it means to, to actually be in that dystopia of authoritarianism, that very difficult word, but word that we have to press down upon, you know, dictatorship, yeah. because certainly we're seeing uh, it globally in the rise of the global right in authoritarian dictatorships. But in Chile, in, in, the, in those years, you know, I, I think there is a way in which my own writing practice, I'm sure you're making practice, we, you know, we, we are always thinking from inside these um, potentialities, these um, collectivities, these ways of making, these ways of thinking. And actually right before COVID, right, um, in 2019, there was a huge uprising in Chile, learn so much from Hong Kong. When you show those masks, the experimentality that was in play globally of learning of how to mm. push back on uh, kind of the police forces. And then later now we see the kind of, of course, influenced by Black Lives Matter and then Black Lives Matter, et cetera. So there's a lot to think about hemispherically there. But what I want to suggest and say about that is that, um, we have to think in these experimental forms and now more than ever. And I think you're right to suggest that, you know, these are the places from which the rich projects otherwise are emerging, right? It's in these shards and in these fragments. And, and these are the things that we have to hold on to. And again, it's below the nation state, it's beyond the nation state, it's yeah. in much smaller scales, and it's in, in other kinds of spaces beyond the normative institutions. So I hear you and I'm with you on that. You know what I like to do is like, uh, a lot of the time when I'm thinking about that issues, um, or like kind of telling the story to myself about what I'm doing or what I'm thinking, uh, is a lot of the time I Google the, the ontological uh, definitions of the words. Right, that I'm trying to tell to myself to like define it to see maybe it's just like a colloquial thing I'm trying to make, make sense, or it actually like how it's rooted in truth. Uh, and so, and a lot of the time, the Google give you this chronology of how often the words being used through time, and it's very fascinating to see how our like understanding of the words changes with that. Right, in, for one of the projects, when I'm thinking a lot about civil disobedience, you can see it like. 1920s, 40s, and 50s, and then goes down to like almost zero use in public media, right? And then, and today I was looking at nostalgia, and it was sort of from like the 90s up, right? It's, it's really fascinating how like um, the language, um, uh, most, I mean, I'm not that familiar with English, so I get to like, I, I have to Google a lot of uh, words. And uh, so I, I start thinking a lot about the, the, what it means that use of language and what it means to like be attached to something that is like um, necessary or necessary or at some point like is part of that vocabulary, but it's not, uh, or it's, but it's not being used enough. Right, those are not to be used as a sign of protest, which are, you know, something that you have written a lot about is like, the social practice of uh, during dictatorship, right? It's like what what kind of like um, quiet gestures of rebellion people do they make during the 70s and 60s and 70s and 80s. You know, when I was a kid, there were a lot of those. Uh, the, the group Cocada in Chile, or like you know, like a little perf uh, like performance by the Ligia Pepe, or um, you know, like all those Tucumanos in in Argentina. There were a lot of groups that they were. Um, it was very fascinating once when I moved he, uh, here in, in the mid 2000s, uh, uh, social practice was a popular thing in contemporary art, right? So you can see all these like artists taking people on wax and doing all this stuff. And I was like, but there is no, there is, there is no fear. There is why, why you need to be quiet about work. If there is like, no one gonna kill you, <laughs> literally, right? So like, you, you like, you just, there is no, there is no danger. So like, why to be quiet? And it, it was very fascinating because like all the things I knew about social practice in Latin America was that like, 
sometimes making anything. And that's why attraction has such a big part. Sometimes anything, anything any, po any po poetical gesture could get you killed. So, so there, is a, there is a kind of wave onto the thing when you move your hand mm -hmm. in the political sphere that I think was, um, um, it was very problematic to know the, how to adapt to the place geographically. The gesture, I just adapting the gesture to the geography. And I think that has been like um, one of the kind of big compromises and things I have to like study a lot to learn how, to, which is the language of the country. I, I move on, I move, I move in. Um, you know, I mean, that is what I, the, the text that you were talking about, Carolina, is oh, like, or oh, the text is like tracing something that is not there, right? How you explain people what is not there. Yeah. Right? Yeah, these absent presences and the kind of, you know, movement between erasure and cultural memory and how to inscribe something back in. Yeah. That's, it's, I'm glad that you brought up the, the term ontology and the word truth, um, because I think it's, it's interesting to think about those words in relation to your work when we think about the material, um, the materials that you're using, um, because a lot of the materials that you're using um, are sort of like reinventing the process or like um, in one of your publications you wrote um, presenting the materials um, to have the potential to be other than what they are, um, which I think is like a key, which is like essentially like a key to sort of like a, to a, it's a resistant gesture, a gesture of resistance, which I think would be interesting to hear you both discuss. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna share my screen for a moment just to talk about, and, and maybe you can, um, Rodrigo, you can maybe talk about the sort of materials in this um, in this work, um, and there's other works, you know, the bar the the barricade works, for example. Um, but uh, this, for me, uh, it, it's it's quite interesting to sort of like imagine these as something like a um, as these chairs not becoming, you know, becoming something other than they are than they appear. Um, you know, it's something that like. Uh, um is is uh, is to consider and this may be of it's not a topic but it's also the age you know in because these chairs are very meaningful to me because i went to like a, like the high school i went and the university of chile it's like i i was in a lot of protests when i was um a, a teenager right and um, and the idea of high schoolers protesting here in the state is 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 unheard of right but you know, like I remember going to protest for a cheaper bus pass, right? Um, and then just like putting these chairs against the, and again, that is the language that you talk about. Like I talk about it under the language that like I was pointing at the plus in some way. Um, um, a lot of the materials that you need to protest institution uh, will be, they are part of the language of the institution itself. So, you know, in a high school, you use the shares to protest the high school, right? In a lot of, um, um, you know, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of situations in the street, you grab tires and you grab like corrugated sheets, a stuff that you find already there, right? So to me, um, they can, the, the, the barricades can be read as like, Polit, uh, as a, like um, kind of social sculptures of um, of civil disobedience, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, and I and I read them like that. So I love that. I like I like that idea of thinking about you know the the kind of instruments of the high school. I, I, you talked about the gesture, Max, but I'm going to go a slightly different direction and and pick up on Rodrigo's idea. And I think when we're thinking about language and and artistic practice, I mean, part of it is also what stories are told about um, the Americas or the hemisphere to each other, right? And the ways in which I think often when, you know, especially as Chilean immigrants or uh, South American immigrants who have experienced dictatorship and then arriving in the United States and feeling that kind of absence of um, acknowledgement of this deep history of U.S. empire and what it means and the traces of that and in all of its forms, right? Um, on the other hand, you know, thinking too about the ways in which certain histories are left out and how there, there are other understandings. So I was thinking about the East 
um, LA walkouts, you know, in the high school histories of high school students and uh, Chicano um, and, and brownness and how brownness, right, kind of does not enter in in the borderlands and those imaginaries always into our understanding of a kind of decolonial decolonizing history and the important radical work and of um, and there was you know uh, Montoya the Lele Montoya was on here and she had to leave but that kind of history um, that her artwork is also a part of this kind of Chicanx Latinx brown history of struggle in the United States that's so I think important and and queered in many ways etc just to bring for forward as well um, so really you know the question of political gesture to me or the important work of actually being able to conceptualize this um, and and to think about these what are the connections right how do the, how do we think of the connections here so your your school chairs made me think about that walkouts you know the walkout and the importance of the walkout right historically. but you know like i mean the, the work that you did uh, with the vj grimaldi is i think it's a good example of um it's so sharp into like um into the performance of political uh, again the political gestures that the government does to repair those problems so to forget and also at the same time to like the, the people resisting the uh, memory right and just trying to do it through like oral history or through like I mean that's simple as like for people to maybe and you say it's not popular but for anybody that have uh, visited Argentina and the the Madres del Plaza de Mayo and uh, on Chile the Desaparecidos like just a photocopy uh, as you know the bad portrait with a photocopy it just means so much for a Chilean right like uh, like the photos of like a disappeared person in a bad in a bad black and white photo it means so much, like just the quality. Zero, so evokes you, like you can down, you can start thinking about the minimum uh, common denominator to feel that kind of like a loss, which is like, you know, the, you start thinking about the photocopy or the Xerox, just the toner is enough sometimes to remind you of that. And uh, like, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think people should know more about the, the video Grimaldi and the, all the problems that there is with the, like, making a, a national park. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, the work that I did specifically was about this peace park and in the moment when um, witnesses and citizens had come together and really, uh, you know, the in an earlier moment at the Peace Park, there wasn't a lot of architectural reference for the torture camp because it had been bulldozed by the dictatorship and the way also authoritarianism bulldozes memory, right? And you find that over and over again. And the extractive scene, what you see is the military tank, how it bulldozes the trees is also another way of thinking about the kind of wound of the earth or the wound of the body um, and those those relationships. But in Via Grimaldi, really what it was is this kind of erasure, despite the fact that people were trying to instantiate and not counter memory or counter memorials. I think that's really important to think about right now. Um, you know, we do need stories about what's happened in specific places. And you think about the massacres upon indigenous territories in the United States, or you think about places of, um, you know, black death. And even here in Williamsburg, when I ride around in my bike, I see the kind of memorials to um, those who were shot by the police, you know, black, uh, black, the photocopy is is really alive right now in these spaces so the kind of low tech but hemispheric resonances i think of the mothers of juarez you know ciudad juarez and feminicide in, in the u.s mexico border so again i i know I'm, I'm sounding a little bit like a broken record but i feel like sometimes we have to tether these histories and so much of the density of things that happen in chile you know, it has such deep connections across these spaces and how to kind of actually showcase that. Um, before in, in, in the field that I study, you know, there I was doing this work on authoritarianism and it was people in the Philippines that were interested and people in other Latin American countries, but suddenly in the United States, there's a real interest in this, right? Fascism, authoritarianism, mm. the military, the police, the, the, the traces, the ruins, the catastrophe, the calamities mm. that you talk about and show in your art. And of course, right, this is what we're up against and the warnings, and there's a lot to be learned from those experiences of struggle and death, social death. In a, in a random dinner party, you start telling them about the the school of the Americas, I'm like, sorry, the brains explode. And they're like, wait, we did that? <laughs> like, we trained people? It is, it is very fascinating. I mean, I wanted to like, 
but there's that like uh, uh, what because what you are doing or what is interesting is kind of this like um, something that is kind of beautiful just as scholars is like this like um, it is kind of forensic uh, forensic emotional gesture right it's like kind of how to trace back something into like um, into existence right and because I think so many people they were like they were designed to be forgotten or they were like um, mostly after amnesty admis or like uh, anything that happened, you know, when I was a kid, it's so almost like doing everything possible to erase as soon as they can, mm -hmm. but then they do a very sloppy job trying to, trying to erase. I just wanted to like show a little piece of a, uh, uh, could you show the Animitas piece of the, the Sin Airways project? That actually I did it in Houston. And this is something that is to me worth remarking, not because right now I'm in, I'm in Vienna, but also, um, um i think it's can you find it max uh mm -hmm. is um it is a uh, because i when i moved to houston i was thinking a lot about um about the, i did this piece where i was thinking a lot about the um i moved there in 2014 right so it was uh, a little bit before people were talking about the taking down the monuments and it was uh, very much very much present in the news and obviously i'm not the first one to think about it and obviously anybody that, that is a person of color that live in the south have to confront that the fact that they are there right but then we also come from latin america and like you know like you may meet your friend by pedro de valdivia's uh, um, horse feet or like you know you can you can encounter Paquedano, you can encounter any person that was kind of like a, like a colonizer like, and they become kind of part of the landscape, right? And they become a meaningful place of meeting and they become a, a meaningful, you know, you may, you know, you may give your first kiss around the color and the, by the feet of the colonizer. So it's just that we have a very interesting dynamic about like, uh, about, about these places, right? So obviously, to me, and because I have experienced for so long this uh, problem of like um, erasing and, and trying to remove something, I was thinking obviously it's fucked up that there is like a Confederate monuments in the uh, in the public and all over, you know. But to me, the biggest problem it was knowing you can know what you hate, but you don't really know what to, what you love, right? So like you don't know which monuments should be for the right guys. So I was thinking a lot about like how to like how to bring up the right the good memories, right? How to use monuments to like know the good times, but actually evoke something that is um, can at least counterbalance the, the 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 pain that these people cause. Right? So what I was doing a lot is like, ah, oh, can you actually go a little bit back to the reference images? Because this is something that like you know if you are in the south you like see it more the animitas that is in Atacama. Um, or they are like, you know, in the neighborhood where I grew up, um, uh, there is a lot of people get shot in the streets. So uh, they, they, there is a lot of this in the corners, right? They are, and, and to me, this was the big, this, this is the monuments I like, right? These are the monuments that for me are important, the unknown people, right? The, the people that die and they get this like, you know, these are the people that like, it's just too easy to hate. And I would love to like take it down through policy, through, a, through different gestures, right? But like, I mean, I think it would be funnier if we put 20 monuments around those guys of people, good people, right? So you are number assholes. But to me, like also it is beautiful. And, I, and so the question when you're making art in this case is, uh, what, is the, what is the qualities that, um, that some physical objects require, in the public to re require to be in the public sphere, right? Uh, to, like, or the, to be part of the consciousness. Right, I like what are the qualities? So then I, that is how I come out with these shapes that I, I, to me, the idea was making this like modular shape that you can give to people. And uh, if you can move a little faster to the, to the images or to the, um, um, right? So I start making this object and I start making this and then I start making a series of photographs that like um, they, they follow this uh, to, you know, consider a scale, if it's a problem of a scale, it's a problem of uh, quality or like materials. So I start making a series of images that they resemble these memorial sites, that they are a possibilities of the same box to become something else and to like move out to, to become some sort of like modular or kind of like uh, memorial site that I, can, that I can eventually, you know, 
give to people and, and uh, to, so they have all the quality of a monument without the problems of uh, the, that you encounter right now. So maybe we can come back to Macarena or to like a question. That's, uh, that, that, that was kind of to me, my, my version of thinking about memorialization, right? It's like to question what is the aesthetic that uh, somebody required to remain in the public consciousness because yeah, slowly we get adapted to like, and we give importance to these things and then and they become key parts of our life. And that is a problem, not a problem of like what are, to me, not a problem that they're, they're, pro, they have, they're part of a problematic history, is that they become part of my personal history. And then I meet my best friend by the colonial food. And then I just like, you know, I have a fight with somebody. Like I, I just have a key moment of my life rare. And then, um, so I, I would like to, you know, kind of not have that emotional, you know, load of, of every single day, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I love how you're thinking about that and talking about that. There's certainly such a deep architectural element to your work, but place matters so much. I think it does in mine as well. You know, we have that commonality that um, constantly trying to, as I said, reinscribe a place with memory and things that aren't there, the traces, the, you know, this, um, you know, for me, as a trained sociologist, this has been very hard. I and I, I, you know, with uh, Herman Gray, we came to talk about the kind of sociology of the trace to even think about like what it means to actually go against uh, the what's there, the empiricism, you know, the imagine of the reality or the figment and to understand the deeper layer. But I love the way you're talking about places as accruing personal meaning and, you know, life histories as being imbricated in place and how you show that with artistic work. I think that is also part of a certain kind of gesture, you know, to go back to Max's um, original question. So I don't know if you wanted to take us somewhere else now, Max. Yeah, I think, you know, I have another question that brings this all back to photography and digitality, but I think we should move on to the, the audience question and answers. Um, so if you're in the audience right now, if you have a question for Macarena and Rodrigo, please go ahead and submit them either in the chat um, on Zoom or in YouTube directly on the comments, and I will field those and uh, present those to our guests. And we have some, and so if any of you are out there are budding photographers or artists working with photography or authors writing about photography, if you have a question, um, that'll solve my, 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 um, my, my lack of time for that. Um, so we have some amazing questions. So I want to start one. This came in from an email, um, and it says, and it's a really, and it is an interesting question of, uh, from a photographer who asks, "How do I best collaborate or participate as a contributing social awareness photographer mm. within the current independent social activism projects uh, to best assist with the cause?" Um, an example. If I wish to utilize my photography as a visual voice and contribute to ongoing issues within our country and communities, how can I establish or best help to uh, initiate change as a visual artist today? Big question. And that's from R Renee Rod Rodriguez. Thank you, Renee. I love that question. I think it's already on so many right tracks in terms of uh, its um, ability to think about engagement and also to pause, right? The kind of pause you hear in the work, the ethical pause, which is about what it means to engage with communities. And Rodrigo rightly pointed out when first coming, you know, to the United States is kind of questioning of the social practice and that language. I mean, I am at an art and design school at Pratt Institute and what social practice means has changed over time. And certainly, you know, we have to question the extractive relationship sometimes of art to communities and, you know, that are marginalized or in, in powerless positions, et cetera, or emergent in their position and seeking of power. But I think the question itself says so, speaks so much to the, to the uh, impulse of the artists. And I, I want to hear Rodrigo's take, but my own take, you know, as a kind of teacher, scholar, thinker, maker, student is really the kind of alongside rather than um, offering a kind of uh, uh, gesture of, of liberation. So what it means to kind of work alongside, to dialogue with, to be uh, with groups of people, to think together, to imagine together, to materially work together and, and to find new forms of representation within the machine, right? So these are the ways in which I think uh, really the kind of, for me, 
to have known Laura Aguilar, to work with her archive, to think with her. The same is true of all of the artists I, I work with and think about and the social movements and the artistic work. I'm often attracted to people who are engaged with the kind of uh, art movement already or social movements, you know, uh, to think of the body as moving and performing and social movements is also doing performance work and artistic work. That to me is a really, really rich way and to document parts of that and engage groups of people, I think is, I don't know, one way to think about this larger interdependent web of relation to think about ontology again, that we're all creating right beyond the institution, below the institution, be alongside. So that's that's my response to that. And I'm sure Rodrigo has things to say as well. No, I mean, I agree is that they, I think that in art education, there's a huge problem with, um, how to say, I mean, you see it in the market right now. And uh, I, I, it's, I think the huge problem in contemporary art currently is that uh, they're making art for curators and for collectors and not really art for other artists and for the community. And I think, and you see it because um, you use uh, identity politics as a, as a rival and not as a departure, right? So a lot of the time you arrive to the conclusion of who you are rather than using who you are to like modify the world around you to like, just like, like and in a lot of these works as have you seen it, it's like kind of propositions for when I see in a still making a work about Trump, I make a work uh, available work about the protests I wish to see during the Trump, right? And when I do it in 2017, it, it, it felt uh, like a little more right, but now it needed a place, you know, like Black Lives Matter get it right. You, you really need to, at some point, you need really need to fuck shit up. Like you can't just like march on a Sunday afternoon and get an Uber right to like, you know, and buy something at the march. You can't just engage in that kind of commitment for like for too long until like, it just becomes kind of like um, kind of like this big nice thing to do when I feel with protests, right? It's not gonna be actually radical change. So, um, so like that, you know, like a lot of the time you have to do is like how to feel about it. You know, I think how like art can I feel and how it's gonna, when it feels right and when it feels wrong and how to like use your, per, your subject position to make art from there. And, and I think, um, I think fulfill expectations of like, if you are Latino, the art needs to look super Latino. And you know, if you're like queer, the world needs to look super queer. Like it's, it's like you can you use your voice, or you use your experience to talk about any policy, food policies, like, you know, like bureaucracy, you know, like um, welfare. I, I mean, I'm really interested in a lot of things that are part of like the, the economic system I live on, right? So that's why I've been putting so much effort into like, into talk about the working class. Because to me, it's like, at the best, I mean, I got lucky that like, you know, I, I moved here without any money or like without speaking English and now I'm a professor, but uh, the, all the people that used to work in, con in construction is like, at the best case, you wanna be working class. Like, so like, to me, it's like, and that is the case of too many immigrants. And that is an American dream. So like, you know, to me, it's like working issues is something that we all kind of like, we all should wake up and go to work. It doesn't matter if you are intellectual or not, right? Like if the professors don't make that much money to like not be my neighborhood. It's like, it's like a working class neighborhood, right? So like those some really, like to me, it's like the things that like I'm, I'm not addressing issues from a Chilean perspective, but I'm not necessarily like trying to evidence uh, kind of like a, like this like a racial politicization that happens so much in the market, right? It's just like, um, so I think, yeah, as I'm saying, uh, using, using identity politics, uh, using your identity and your feelings as a, as a departure to understand the work is a, uh, and both can happen, policy and, and theorization and education can happen parallel. You know, I think it's so many times like we've been taught to like pick one side or the other. And I think all the time, everything can happen at the, at the same time. And I think that is, uh, I mean, that's try, something I try to tell my students a lot of time. It's like, you know, making beautiful images and being politically charged doesn't need to be mutually exclusive, right? Making, um, and at the same time that being politically active and being emotionally committed to something else doesn't mean just doesn't doesn't, can, doesn't need to be separate. Actually, they need to be together, uh, right? So, yeah, it's like yeah, I'm, I'm, how how things make you feel and how is actually how you gonna act. There's a there's a still something that I have to remind 
when I'm when the work is getting too heady or when something uh, uh, people want to only talk about certain aspects of the work is like is that like uh, you know thoughts produce feelings and feelings produce thoughts so and that usually is like you know the political movement so the political environment you live produce feelings you know and those produce thoughts and you have this kind of cycle around um, that's very important to remark on education we have another interesting question for both of you uh, from Anna Ortega, who says, Macarena and Rodrigo, thank you uh, for such an enlightening conversation. Uh, when you're talking about art institutional critique, uh, I remember something I heard once from an indigenous Brazilian artist called Javier Sabel. He said that he didn't understand why our exhibition system and art system was based in hiding, is more in hiding than showing. He says, you hide uh, you hide, hide, and then show, referring to the time and the amount of artwork stay hidden, that stay hidden in the museum and galleries. Um, I was curious to hear uh, your thoughts about this, um, what, uh, what the art system hides, and maybe how you think, uh, how you think about new models um, for that, for the art system. I think this is a wonderful question, Anna, and I thank you for posing it in such a really brilliant way. And um, I, I think the fact that you kind of started with an, uh, an indigenous, you know, perspective on the kind of colonial museum is really critical. It reminds me of the work of Francisco Wichegueo, which is uh, Rodrigo is also a friend of and whose work I've written about. And in work in the Santiago Ar Archaeological Museum, he really brought forward a Mapuche perspective on the, uh, the, the museum itself. And rather than have objects that are lined up in very kind of the Western model of curatorial practice where you have, uh, you know, titles and things exhibited in chronology and behind glass cases, he put uh, these objects and symbols and, um, and works and musical instruments of Mapuche daily life in, in display in a, in a wonderful kind of moving exhibition that actually had flying objects at times or had the sacred objects in their actual ritual use that used a video montage in combination with the beautiful blue scape of the Peramonton or the dreamscape of the, the gallery space itself. And that's how I'm responding to your question to suggest, I think what the, the kind of art institution hides is often taking and abstracting either objects in, a, in the ethnographic sense, you know, uh, and reducing it or, um, you know, trying, as Rodrigo was saying earlier, not showing the scaffolding behind what goes into it, whether it be labor or embodiment or a longer kind of commodity chain, all of that gets written out in a very discreet kind of, um, uh, you know, traditional conventional Euro Eurocontinental museum practice. So I think part of it is to, to expose these pieces, right? And expose these fragments and show a kind of deeper, richer history, both to object collections um, and to display that I think is really, really essential for the, the work of decolonizing both the museum and the relations within the museum, right? As Fred Wilson, you know, points us to the security guards and um, often people of color, black and brown um, security guards that are guarding these spaces. So, yeah, thank you. Wonderful, Anna. That is the that is the um, in the pre-Columbian museum in Santiago. It's a, there's a there's a nice quote on top. There's kind of hiding that say, uh, "Lo quieras o no, no hay." No hay, no hay obra de arte que sea inocente o algo así and, and, and it, I, I remember seeing it and it's really like it was very interesting it, which means that you wanted to know there is not such a thing as innocent art right and it's, I think that it's like um, it's very interesting to consider like that um, the idea of how like um, you know rupturist or like uh, transgressive can be uh, you know fry pans or like uh, mundane objects, right? When you are educating people about certain uh, way of living, right? And I think it's like, um, and, I, and I think it's, it's really interesting to leave, uh, give room for those, um, for the, for kind of everyday life to be art and to think about it and to think about it in a poetic way, right? It's like, not just, it's not just art because it's everyday life, but it's all depends how you reframe it and how you, how you present it and, and how you enjoy it, right? So like, um, uh, yeah, it, it is very, it's very interesting to be 
uh, able to, I mean, I go to a lot of museums here. I've been, I mean, in Europe for like a month and a half and, and it's, it's really interesting to not go to contemporary museums and it really uh, kind, of, kind of trace back how how the history of Europe got to be so fucked up, right? <laughs> like and, and so, in so weird way that I've been going to all these catacombs and all these places of death. And it's like really, really fascinating to consider how how we learn, I mean, how how back you can go to learn about something, right? And um, But mostly, um, yeah, considering the, that uh, anthropological museums have a very interesting agenda, like and how you can disrupt it by bringing artists, right? To eliminating those hierarchies of like who, sorry, Max, about curators, but it's you know, also thinking that uh, sometimes probably it could be nice for institution, leave the artists, the artists are, you know, the art, the art. And I think there is all, all the, um, or bring different kind of intellectuals to make connections, different connections, because I mean, we all have limitations, right? In the same way, like I cannot put together like a research like Macarena can do, um, or a museological project as Max can do, you know, there's, uh, there's, there is certain, certain strategies that we can use to like disrupt those um, kind of, again, monolithic attitudes that museums and institutions have. Yeah, I agree with you on that, Rodrigo. No offense taken, uh, but and and I do, and I, I do think um, you know when you were saying thinking about the concept as a departure and not as a point of arrival, I think that's a methodology that um, that institutions can use um, and also like curators can use uh, rather than start if you do a group show, don't end with the the concept, start with the art. <laughs> and then depart yeah. from there. Um, and you, you can better navigate um, maybe some of these uh, colonial issues um, and, and also have a sense of awareness while you do it because you encourage interruption, you encourage a not knowing, um, which is so important to doing anything is to, um, to, to kind of not know and move through it um, and learn. We have one more question. Um, it's uh, from John Silver, who says, well, faced with the ongoing pandemic, what issues have you encountered as an artist um, with recent world views, whether they be moral, political, or ethic ethical? Has this opened up a platform for you to delve uh, into deeper issues linked through the crisis? Has this elevated or inspired any recent work? Um, and do you think that artists should try to bring attention to these bigger issues versus uh, simply aesthetical, uh, aesthetic approach uh, in their work? And, and I would pose that to both of you, essentially, um, this is a good, good question um, that I think a lot of people have for all makers and thinkers and doers right now. Um, although I think of this time, this year, and this moment as a period of suspended dread. So that's it's been going on for a long time. Um, but it, but it is the the pandemic does raise a certain paradox where time seems to simultaneously move incredibly fast while moving incredibly slow. And, and, and that's in relation to sort of social movements and, and uh, political tweets. So I don't know. I'm going to throw that to you all. And I'm curious to hear what you say. I mean, you know, I, mean, I, was, I wonder what, uh, what Macarena uh, think about this kind of like um, questions. Because I mean, as artists, I get them a lot. But I wonder if writers get them a lot about the form and content uh, questions, right? It's like, uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, if the researched prose could be too beautiful, maybe, or could be too, too fun to read, right? It's like, or something like that. It's like, it's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very interesting. I, I mean, I want to hear how, how Magdalena feels about the, the this, this aesthetic versus moral issues in at least in research. Or so I don't know how that happened in, 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 in academic research. I mean, I think one way I'd answer that question, um, and it's a good one, is really, uh, you know, the pandemic certainly has brought up so many issues, right? It's a kind of a ex great accelerator of many uh, conditions that are already in play. And as we know, um, to me, it's brought a question to the Academy that's not um, very interesting to me, actually, but I think as we see the Academy beginning to be in ruins in some ways is facing like so many other industries, you know, um, 
the problems of attrition and enrollment and tuition and you know uh, student debt and these ongoing issues, suddenly you hear elite universities and people who have had tenure for a long time never raised this question before. What does it mean to be in the public sphere? What does it mean to have work that crosses what it, it crosses over? You know, outside of the walls of the academy, and it's frustrating to me to hear this conversation come so late, come so um, in the face of economic exigency rather than as a kind of political impulse of putting the resources of an institution again at the hands of, you know, kind of public policy to use the language of Rodrigo. So for me, this has been the crisis is an opportunity to think of those things, but it is also suspended time between what was and what will be, right? To use Max's language of the suspension, which I think is a really good language. And I do think it is this opportunity for these um, really interesting entanglements. Uh, I mean, the, the questions of, you know, research ethos, ethics and all of that, I, I, that's a much longer issue. And, you know, we could talk about another time, but I do, I do wanna suggest, you know, um, what are the resources we have? What are the ways we can kind of tether together, create forms of interdependence to actually imagine this, this other world, this world uh, where we don't have to wear masks in front of a kind of military um, you know, tank all the time to, to just live for principles and, and imagine kind of life, you know, a, a, a social life worth living together, you know, um, rather than having to kind of die to, to, to do this. Um, so that, that's what I'd say. And, and it is the role of mediators, you know, those of us who mediate institutions and other spaces to actually put this question very centrally uh, uh, to us in this moment of such deep health social crisis, public crisis. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, quietly, you know, it's, it's interesting because you don't, sometimes it's hard because you want to go to school as an educator trying to make uh, radical changes. And then you realize that like, sometimes by the fact, by it's so fucked up that by the fact that you're there, it already feels like a radical changes, <laughs> right? So like, it's, it's really interesting that like, um, you know, you, um, and, they, they, and I try to do my best for my, I mean, you know, like I try to do this, it, it, my set of references, the education I provide is different, right? It's like, it is to me, it's like, the heroes are like with Laura Aguilar and other, uh, you know, like I tried to, last, last quarter I taught a class about um, Latino and Asian writers talking about American culture, right? So I was like, I was interested in like thinking about, um, kind of cultural criticism from the Latin American perspective and from the Asian American perspective. And thinking a lot about kind of like, um, you know, basically it's like the non-hot topics, but also interesting that like, uh, that like the school is moving slowly and the more, more artists of color. And now I have more capacity to pick students that come to study with me and the grad program. And we have an incredibly diverse program. And it's, it's, very, it's very nice to, can I start modifying the school slowly through the years? And, and I think it's uh, the change gonna happen slow, but I think um, it's, uh, it is it's very interesting because uh, at the same time, COVID and like my research have made me so aware that um, the future of uh, the, the future problems is, it's, we wanna have a, a, huge, a huge problem with work, you know, they, 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 and mostly being in a school where by the end of the year, uh, of, of seniors are all asking for recommendation letters to get an internship or a job or like an unpaying job. And I was like, you went to school, you shouldn't work for free. And then, but it's like a way to like kind of afford a resume It's working for free. So we have a very like problem in the system of, econ the, of the capital, how, who earn it and how much, how economically fit you need to be to endure capitalism. Right, and I think, um, and I think this, and now you prove it. You know, I mean, if you have, if you didn't have savings, you are like about to die in COVID. And uh, and so I think we're gonna have to like do a lot of kind of like um, social research and networking, and kind of like uh, and find a lot of this kind of um, and, and really trust our community because our same organizations and uh, um, institutions and government are not to be trusted. I mean, they are, I don't think they are. Um, yeah, they're concerned well-being, like feelings and well-being. I think it's very complicated uh, for them to like 
put a put a money symbol on it. You cannot put a money symbol. You cannot really like advocate for it. Um, yeah. So. I mean, really, you know, I I think about. Uh... I really appreciate the fact that certain artists have taken up and thinkers this concept that I put on the table of the extractive zone or ex extractive zones. And if you think about it, really, you know, these kind of places that are thieve off of biodiverse resources. And, you know, um, so I was talking about territories that were indigenous and had, you know, deep biodiverse resources, but all kinds of communities, uh, you know, are um, thieved upon, right, and are extracted upon. So the question is, if there are many extractive zones, like what does a non-extractive uh, kind of relation look like? What are non-extractive forms of being and relating to each other? What are non-extractive ways of engaging um, that don't go back into a, the, the institution as Rodrigo's you know, gesturing towards? These are always corrupt and we see it. We see it not only in the national level, international level right now, but very locally, the kind of ways in which we don't have a lot of really good leadership, you know, um, however you define that term, not, there's not a lot of ideas that are kind of emerging as, as really being able to, to break open this paradigm that's not working for anyone really, for, for most people at least, except for the 0.1% or whatever it is. So yeah, the, the kind of non-extractive uh, future, I think, or to, is part of this kind of project. Um, and, and the artist, you know, and the, the thinker, the writer, all of us really together, how to imagine our way into that. I really do think that's part of the, the work we have to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting to think about that as, um, I mean, I, because you said non-extracted and I, I'm constantly thinking about um, creating this kind of like symbiotic relationships between the, my subjects and the work and uh, kind of letting the work uh, or as you said like the, the materials even talking to back to my camera or talking like um, there is something that you learn from the object that you place in front right so like you pay you, sometimes you make work about playing homage to the knowledge that you get from those people or the objects Right, and so like the piece become amplified because I'm in the certain position where people will look at that video or will see the show, right? And that knowledge get amplified, right? And so it's it's not it's not of millions, but it's like it is um, it is larger than screaming alone in the street, right? So like when you when you when you build as an artist this kind of symbiotic relationship with subjects and materials that are meaningful that transmit history. I think they, they, a lot of uh, radical changes can happen through education and through care. And I think those are two, two issues that I think um, should be taught more in school or like artists should more like uh, projects of care and, and education, like as a way to like, not lecture, but kind of like inform or like, a, or, like, or like feed into knowledge, into like some sort of like, you know, lineage of knowledge. Um, yeah. Well, thank you both. I, I think that's a great place to end. Um, you know, and I think it, I think this conversation, you know, in one way, just having you two here as examples of people who look at the world for these, like, to find these sort of like potentials and new imaginaries and also to like new ways of thinking, new modes of thinking and ways of recognizing, um, you know, interesting things, um, and despite the sort of like contemporary condition of crisis, um, it, that's important. And, um, and I want to thank, so I want to thank you both again. Thank you so much for taking time um, to meet with us, oh, Macarena and Rodrigo. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. And I, and I also want to thank um, Vinod Hobson, who's behind the scenes here, making sure the show runs, and uh, the whole team at PhotoFest who makes sure that the whole uh, thing runs. And, um, and then I and then I also um, and then I also want to say that if you enjoyed this program, uh, we have a bunch of amazing public programs at PhotoFest coming up. Um, the next one is on Tuesday, October twentieth, and is a conversation between curator Legacy Russell and writer Andre Brock Jr. It's going to be um, really interesting, and uh, you can find all of that information by typing PhotoFest into to Google and then clicking on the link um, to our website. Um, thank you all again for joining us. Um, I hope you have a good night and um, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank Max, you. everyone. Thanks thank you, Max. Magdalena, a pleasure. Rodrigo, igual. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.